the children you have been looking at are all blind. Nine people out of ten, if they were shown these children, would be filled with pity. Poor kids. They're different from the rest of us. How sad. A very human reaction, but quite wrong. The Royal National Institute for the Blind have a different principle. Their nine Sunshine Home nursery schools in England and Wales have started thousands of blind children on the road to a happy adult life. Their motto is, a blind child is primarily a child. The staff of a Sunshine Home give a maximum of love and understanding to their pupils. But tearful pity, no. And few blind people of any age would thank you for pity. Like the rest of us, all they ask is to stand on their own feet, to be human in the human community. Even for the sighted, learning to live is a long process. For the blind, there are certainly added difficulties, but they can be overcome. And this is the task which the RNIB has set itself. The measure of its success? Britain has a higher proportion of blind people in normal competitive jobs than any other country. Each of these children has every chance of growing up to be a self-reliant citizen, earning his living as his abilities suggest and not as his handicap dictates. The Sunshine Homes cater for children from about three years old, or sometimes younger in special circumstances, until they are ready to move to their big schools at about seven. The important thing is that the children come to the Sunshine Homes at the moment which is best for them and their families. Each home is a large family rather than a small institution. They have come here for many reasons. Some have no homes or broken homes. Some have additional physical handicaps. But many come here because their parents sincerely believe that expert teaching will give them a better start. Whenever possible, a child is admitted to the home nearest to its own. The staff work closely with the parents, who are encouraged to have their children home and to visit them as often as they can. But whatever a child's background, a sunshine home helps him to feel a member of a community, his most important lesson. Blind children are excellent listeners, so music, stories and poetry play a great part in the life of a sunshine home. Hearing and touch are the blind child's two great channels of learning. Both must be developed to a high pitch of sensitivity, so that in those two ways at least, the blind child becomes actually superior to his sighted friends. He needs more encouragement and stimulus than a sighted child, and more patience. Most intelligent parents have plenty of patience, but faced with the problem of bringing up a blind child, they almost all have one failing in common, overprotection. And here too, the RNIB can help. At its parents' unit in South Devon, skilled staff help parents to overcome the dangers of anxiety, which can do more harm than good, and pass on to them their experience in the training of blind children. The unit is a self-contained house, furnished and fitted like a normal private home. Here, a mother, and if possible, father too, can stay for a week or so. The visiting mother helps prepare the meals and run the house. For one of the most difficult things she has to learn is how to combine her special task as the mother of a blind child with her duties as a wife and housekeeper. Perhaps the most encouraging lesson the parents learn is that they are not alone in their problem, that there are other blind children in Britain and an organization to help them, the RNIB, which is the largest and most experienced of its kind in the world. The parents' unit is in the grounds of Court Grange, one of the nine Sunshine Homes. So a visiting mother has what may be her first opportunity to see blind children growing up together in a cheerful and active community. And it may be here for the first time that she fully realizes the opportunities which lie ahead for her child of becoming a self-confident and productive member of society.
Another activity which is of very great help is the parents' meeting. These meetings are held regularly with the headquarters staff and they give the parents a chance to ask as many questions as they wish of both its blind and its sighted members. But quite apart from having their questions answered, the chief benefit the parents derive from these meetings is the one we have already mentioned, the realization that they are not alone. They may come with a natural feeling that they've been singled out by fate for disaster. But when they meet and make friends with other parents of blind children, their confidence returns. They discover a whole world they knew nothing of before. Not only an organization for helping the blind, which is unequaled in any other country, but large numbers of blind people of all ages leading happy, successful, and surprisingly normal lives. The questions are many and varied. Should I learn Braille myself? The answer is yes, certainly. It will help you to share your child's problems, to write to him when he's away, to read his letters. As a result of the parents' meetings, evening classes are run to teach Braille to the sighted, most of them parents, husbands, or wives of blind people. What secondary modern education is available to blind children? What jobs can they do afterwards? To all these, as well as to such odd questions as, do blind people dream, the staff give helpful answers. And when the meeting itself is over, the more informal but equally important part of the program begins. The exchange of experience over a cup of tea. Very soon, even for the newcomers, the strangeness is forgotten. They're just parents discussing their children. Not ordinary children, perhaps, but what children are ordinary? Certainly none in their parents' eyes. And when you get down to it, the parents are right. There is no such thing, thank heavens, as an average child. From the Sunshine Homes, most of the children pass on to the primary schools for the blind, their big schools. Like their sighted brothers and sisters, they take, at about 11 or 12, an examination for admission to a secondary school. And here, at Chorleywood College, the RNIB's grammar school for girls, they have the chance to develop their natural intelligence to professional levels. Normality is the keynote. Except for the Braille textbooks and other pieces of equipment unfamiliar to a sighted person, this might be any normal public school. Sighted people are often surprised at just how much a blind youngster can learn to do. Like most other teenage girls, a blind girl wants to acquire all a woman's accomplishments. Even if she aims at a career, she usually hopes for a family as well, and would be ashamed of not being able to cater for it. A hot gas stove holds no terrors for an intelligent blind girl with her highly developed senses of touch, smell, taste and hearing. She can soon learn to cope as well as her sighted sister. Even better, for, between ourselves, quite a few husbands wish their wives had a more highly developed sense of taste. Another sense which blind people must develop fully is that of space and distance. For this is the basis of their confidence and independence. So gymnasium training is an important part of the curriculum. The apparatus is carefully designed, but really very little different from that in any other gymnasium. The girls' freedom of movement, their sureness, is another thing which takes many sighted visitors by surprise. In the school's common room, fingers are busy. Those delicate fingers which share with the ears the tasks of the darkened eyes. Knitting, of course, is a very popular hobby. Another girl is making notes in Braille from the book she is reading. You may have noticed that although she reads her book from left to right, running her fingers along the embossed lines as you would run your eyes along a line of type, she makes her notes through the special stencil from right to left, for the sheet of paper must be turned over to be read so that the pricked marks become raised dots. The sense of touch and the sense of hearing work together in music. 
Here too, the genius of Louis Braille, the French saddler's son who opened the world of books to the blind, comes to their aid. For a complete system of Braille music notation enables them to learn scores without sighted help. Light means nothing to her, but she has created her own. Over to Worcester College, the RNIB's grammar school for boys. Like Chorley Wood, there is little to differentiate it, at first glance, from a sighted school of comparable standing. The target is the same, all-round development, with the emphasis on independence, self-reliance, self-confidence. There is no preconceived idea of what a blind person can or cannot learn to do. The RNIB staff at Worcester, Chorley Ward and elsewhere, for all their long experience, are always prepared to be surprised, and frequently are. One famous school of psychology maintains that man, physically the weakest and most defenseless of all mammals, has not only survived, but also developed the mental powers which raise him so high above his fellow creatures solely by his gift of compensating for his own handicaps. Nature does the same. The healed fracture is stronger than the bone around it. The scar is tougher than the undamaged skin. But man has carried compensation to a level unparalleled in the rest of nature. Supporters of this theory might well point to the blind as convincing evidence of its truth. In teaching the blind, much more individual attention is necessary than with sighted children, because even in the classroom, so much is normally learned by imitation. Few of us realize also to what extent poise, good manners, and a confident bearing are acquired by unconscious imitation of respected teachers. Hobbies and handicrafts are in many ways easier to teach than some other subjects. And of course, the boys vary in their aptitudes and interests as much as sighted boys. Worcester does its best to discover and develop each boy's special gifts. The science curriculum includes biology, chemistry and physics, which are taught in a well-equipped laboratory. Many of the professions into which Worcester boys make their way require a sound general scientific training. For example, physiotherapy, farming, engineering and radio. Much of the equipment is standard, but some has to be adapted for blind use. For example, this meter is read by touch. The college has its own dramatic society, an excellent activity in many ways, for quite apart from training the blind boy's most vital piece of mental equipment, his memory, it also helps to develop his poise and self-confidence. A blind person has to be something of an actor, not in the sense of pretending to be something other than himself, but because he has to live and deport himself in a world whose conventions are based on sight. So inevitably he too, in order to appear natural and feel at ease, must learn to behave to a certain extent as though he were sighted. Worcester College has a well-equipped stage in the gymnasium and assembly hall where many kinds of plays are presented. This particular performance is of the Cane Mutiny Court Martial. Chess is good training for what may be called positional memory, the ability to comprehend a complex but developing situation. Blind youngsters take well to chess. Proof of this is the fact that the college has held the Worcestershire Public Schools Championship more than 20 times. The county team has frequently included several college boys, and old boys have reached international standing in the chess world.
By no means all the college activities are sedentary. Judo is popular. And, of course, it is another excellent way of teaching self-confidence. Every boy likes to feel he could give a good account of himself if he were attacked. And there is nothing to prevent a blind boy or girl from acquiring that ability. College has a running track and sports field. High jumping develops freedom of movement and an accurate judgment of space and distance. Not all the pupils at Worcester College, or for that matter at Chorleywood or the Sunshine Homes, are totally blind. Those who have a little sight are encouraged to make use of it to the limits recommended by the school's ophthalmic consultant. In activities such as running, they may be able to help and guide their totally blind comrades. And this teaches them to regard the sight they have as an asset, instead of merely being conscious that it is less than other people's. dining hall is evidence of another athletic field in which the college has been able to achieve success, rowing. It has its own boats and boathouse on the River Severn and crews with a sighted cox take part in regattas and hold races with other schools. <laughs> 